Softball started in Chicago with the Farragut Boat Club. They wrapped up a boxing glove and hit it with a broomstick handle. And slow pitch, what we now call slow pitch, was born. But the pitcher was not allowed to strike out the batter. It just let it go as if you're pitching horseshoes. So we went to what we now call softball, the 12-inch softball, but they were still not allowed to strike out the batter. With the ball being smaller, they hit it farther, so the pitcher started throwing it with more speed on it, what we call modified slow pitch. Then it went to what we call orthodox. And the pitchers were not allowed to wear a glove to hide the ball in, so to keep the batter from seeing how you held the ball, you had to have some way to cover it. Well, the pitchers that pitched orthodox would go like this. But we started throwing slingshot and then windmill. And when we threw windmill, we threw the twist. So you really couldn't see how you held the ball. Well, by now, the game started speeding up. And we are allowed to wear a glove. And with the glove, the pitcher was able to keep the bat from seeing how you held the ball. When we would throw the ball, we keep the ball completely covered all the way through the windup. You'd have fellows that would throw windmill with one time around. Some fellows would throw it many times around. And then there was a guy that threw it this way. Here, pitcher Eddie Fainer shows the bewildering technique with which he strikes out an average of 17 batters per game. Playing against capable nine-man teams, Fainer and his three teammates have won 378 games while losing only 56. Fainer says he can pitch two full games without throwing the same pitch twice. While barnstorming around the country, Fainer pitches every day, sometimes in both games of a doubleheader. Pity the batter who never knows when or from where the ball is coming. As if his duties on the mound weren't enough, Fainer must often cover first when a lucky batter connects. Even an outfield hit will be retrieved by the infield which consists of a shortstop and a first baseman. They allow an average of less than one and a half runs per game. Maybe Fainer looks like he isn't going to try a pickoff play, but watch him. Because they can't get enough teams to risk playing them, the King and his court have signed up with a nine-man team, which, as you might expect, has become a softball terror. Hello, I'm Jack Knight, and it's been my good fortune to be part of the King and his court since 1981, and my pleasure now to be your host for this nostalgic look at the highlights of the best-loved, longest-running, most highly awarded, and truly entertaining softball exhibition shows in sports history. A story that, as Eddie said, all started on a dare. Just a few months out of service with the Marine Corps in World War II, Eddie, like other returning servicemen, was finding it difficult to get a steady job. But a good pitcher could often find a job with a company team that sponsored a competitive group and Eddie was a very good pitcher. At one time or another, he hooked up with Grimshaw Tires and one of the better teams in the Northwest at that time, the Turling Construction Company. Early in 1946, Eddie hooked up with some fellas to play a game south of the border in Oregon. Uh, it was a rout, and after the game, the losers got to name calling. Well, Eddie being as boastful and cocky as he could be, said that he could play them again and beat them with only his catcher but that they'd probably walk them both. Well, the other team dared him uh, to put his quite 
valuable reputation on the line and play him with only four players. Well, the gauntlet having been thrown down, the king turned to three of his teammates to rise to the occasion. Meade Kinzer, his catcher since grade school. Mike Mileke, later dubbed the Ted Williams of softball, a shortstop, and power hitting first baseman, Kenny White. They played a few scrimmage games at the local prison to get their defenses straight and accepted the challenge. The result of that fateful game was a rout. In the stands was a promoter from Idaho. He suggested a second game over his way. Well, that game was a rout too, no surprise. Big surprise was the King's share of the gate. More money than they were making on their regular jobs. They named themselves the King and his court and the four barnstormers extraordinaire were on the road. And Jerry Jones joined the team because he was the only one with a car. The first game played under the King and his court banner was booked up in Trail, British Columbia, up in Canada, by Art Masisco. He's seen here, and on the right, Fergie Ferguson. He was one of the players on the team that lost that night. Well, there were lots more games that summer, and more in 1947, 48, and then, after a number of victories, they met up with Bo Willis. They were playing nose to nose, straight up. Yeah, they, uh, they came down to Eugene and we played them and uh, they had just won 86 straight games. And I couldn't tell you today what the score was. Bo Willis was a heck of a gentleman and a heck of a pitcher. There were very few losses over those first years and the ratio over history is 12 to one. And sometimes we played 200 games in a season without a loss. While the team continued to play nine-man ball in those early years, and in 1952, they hooked up with the Miami Flyers. 1953 found them in the NSC tournament championship finals. Well, they lost, but Eddie was named 1953 first team All-American. By that time, the team could truly say that they were world champions. In 1950, they had beaten the Tip Top Tailors from Toronto, who were the reigning champions at that time. And the King and his court had gained international recognition. But the King and his court was not the only team to enjoy popularity. Of course, they were the Harlem Globetrotters, the House of David baseball team. They were clowns. The Iowa Colored Ghost baseball team was one incarnation of teams with the same name. This one was managed by Rip Collins. Showboat Clay led the Harlem Clowns. And the incomparable dribbler Marcus Haynes was with the Harlem Magicians for over 30 years and countless others. They say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And so it was with the king and his court. Several teams popped up trying to capitalize on the success and popularity of the king and his court. There was a Canadian team called Prince and his Knights. There was Rosie Black, great, great woman pitcher who fronted the queen and her maids, later the queen and her court. The Philadelphia Hobos had a comedy group and their pitcher pitched on stilts. Rich Hoppy toured with his group, Hoppy and the Hustlers, before he joined the court. And the absolute finest sports comedian, Gary West, a longtime member of the court, took a few years off for touring to go with another comedy great, Trino Palacios and the California Cuties, and later with his own group, Softball Fever. Because of the unique nature of the show, the court drew more media attention than most. Here's an early newsreel feature, a clip from the 1950s. Here, Eddie warms up before the game with a blazing crossfire drop. Now the team is ready and all set to go with young Eddie Jr. as bat boy. Uh-oh, this batter is in big trouble with that tricky windup. And the crowd loves Eddie's between-the-legs delivery. This loopy changeup didn't fool the batter. This time, 
resulting in a rare base hit. For the man on base, watch for a no-look behind the back pickoff try. Ooh, that was close. Now pitching on his knees, the King gets an easy out on a grounder to short. Now it's the court's time to go to work at bat. Here's Jerry Jones booming a home run with a man on. Imagine how the batter feels when he faces the King pitching blindfolded. Here's the strikeout in slow motion. Strike three! You're out. And another batter goes down swinging. Going from second base, the King gets a strike on the batter before he gives up another rare hit. But the threat has ended when the fabulous Whirly gig behind the back, phantom third strike pitch comes right in there. Or did it? When the batter was called out, he complained that the pitch was high. A round of handshakes, and the king shows the crowd the phantom pitch one more time. Final demonstration pitch and another sensational show from the King and his court is in the books. In Eddie's heyday, radar guns were far in the future. But on the day after the court beat the tip-top tailors at the Canadian National Exposition in 1950, scientists at the University of Windsor, Ontario, near Detroit, used new high-speed military cameras intended for use in ballistics to check the speed of Eddie's fastball. After 40 pitches, filming from all angles, they concluded that the King was throwing over 104 miles an hour. The second generation of the court features Eddie's son, J.R., Al Jackson, and Gary West. Here's a promo film Eddie produced in that era. I'm Eddie Thainer. If you're into softball, you might recognize the name. If not, you might have heard of me as a pitcher of the original four-man softball team called the King and His Court. 1976 will represent our 31st year on tour. If you haven't seen this great team yet, you may want to come out and see us this year. We'll be playing here this week. You know, I guess we're just about the most unique sports show in the world, with the possible exception of the Hardham Globetrotters. As a matter of fact, you might say our show is very much like the Harlem Globetrotters because we combine comedy with the ability to play a game better, I guess, than anybody in the world. And we've played in over 3,000 different cities. Who are the other players, Eddie? I'm glad you asked. Take Al Jackson, for instance. Al's playing in his 19th season with the King and his court. An interesting fact about Al is that he once came to bat 421 times without a strikeout. Al's also hit more home runs to this date than Hank Aaron. Come on out and see Al hit and play first base. He may hit a home run for you. Then there's J.R. Fainer. If the name sounds familiar to you, it's because J.R. is my son. But he's not a member of the King's Court because we're related. J.R. happens to be one of the best hitters and can play all of the positions equally well, including catching me. And that's something I can never do. For comedy relief, we've got the routines of Gary West. I can't really describe to you how funny this man really is. But I guarantee that when Gary does his stuff, you'll see a combination of comedy and ball playing unmatched by anybody on the circuit today. The newest member of the Kenya's court is the great catcher from the Pro Leagues in Western Canada, Les Barber. 
Les makes catching me look easy. Because he's so smooth and agile behind the plate, with those long arms, he seems to catch anything I throw without worrying about signals or anything else. As for my role in the show, I naturally have the modest title of the king. Of course, that's what the other people who see the act call me. Actually, my name really was King. Here are some samples of just what I do in our show. If you've not seen our show, I think you ought to come see it. We're going to be playing against a very fine nine-man team made up of local ball players here this week. And if you've seen the show before, you'll enjoy it again because this team can really hit. It's a little known fact that besides being the best softball pitcher in history, Eddie Fainer was quite a bowler. This is his personal ball, 16 pounder, has his name on it. He started out as a pin setter and eventually ended up in the Washington State Championships. He's rolled a couple of 300 games and in an exhibition at the New York Coliseum for AMF automatic pin setters, he bowled with Frank Krause and Hall of Famer Lou Campy. At that time, he bowled a 4-7, 6-10 split, and made it, blindfolded, and between his legs. I'm no golfer, but Eddie is. He started playing golf almost the same time he started pitching. And Sam Sneed, the immortal Hall of Famer, actually gave him his first set of clubs and golf shoes. He's played in over 300 pro-am and celebrity tournaments with the great players of the day and socially, his list of partners has included a who's who of international and national celebrities. In a 1967 fundraiser at Dodger Stadium with celebrities including Clint Eastwood, Steve Allen, Beverly Hill Billy Max Baer, and Get Smart's Don Adams, celebrities manager Leo the Lip DeRocher put Eddie in the game to pitch against an impressive lineup of major leaguers. He faced Roberto Clemente, Maury Wills, Willie McCovey, Brooks Robinson, Harmon Killebrew, and Willie Mays. The King struck them all out in succession and Cade Pete Rose twice. I guess if Paul Bunyan had been a softball player, he might have used a bat as big as this. Man, this is heavy and hard to swing. So. Instead of swinging a bat like that, the king became famous for using a bat that was only 22 inches long. At first, he used it to bunt with, but then used to take full swings. As a matter of fact, on the CBS Sports Spectacular in 1972 with Jack Whitaker, he actually hit a ball out of the park with this diminutive little bat. Anecdotally, it was Amos Alonzo Stagg the immortal college football coach who gave Eddie the idea. Eddie also used this bat for a while playing with the court. He designed it himself. It has a flat surface, much flatter than with a regular round bat. You've got more flat surface to hit the ball. And it's kind of triangle shape. I used to use this. Could hit it a long way. Eddie's appeared in benefits and shows for just about every cause that there is. But one of the recognition plaques that he received stands out in his memory. It was the first televised muscular dystrophy telethon, and this plaque from Jerry Lewis. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who made lethal weapon more powerful with his explosive presence, Danny Glover. And now we present a special Victor Ward to someone who may be the greatest pitcher who ever pitched a game. When he first started out, his fastball had been clocked at 100 miles an hour. Now, at this point, you must have guessed that I'm talking about Sandy Koufax or Lefty Gomez or Bob Feller. 
but you guessed wrong. Put them all together, throw in Nolan Ryan, Steve Carlton, and Walter Johnson, add up all their winning games and strikeouts, and you still don't have the answer. Sandy Koufax never won 200 games a year. This man did. The immortal Christy Matheson didn't have 1,000 no-hit victories. This man did. All the names I just mentioned together didn't come anywhere near to pitching 120,000 strikeouts. The man we're honoring tonight did all that, and he did it underhand with a softball. He's truly the king, and the others on his team are called his court, and they take on all comers. The difference is there are only four players on their team, and all the teams they play against have nine on their side. And the king and his court still win eight out of every nine games they play. And after 44 years of doing it, he's still pitching 200 games a year, every year. Of course, he's slowed up a bit lately. Today, at age 64, he only pitches at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a special Victor Award to the king, the great Mr. Eddie Feiner. Thank you very much, City of Hope and the Sporting News. I don't know how to express myself, actually. We've been out here 44 years, and I thank more than you know for this uh, award, and God bless you. In the 1980s, in Japan, one of their top reality TV shows was called Challenger. They sent a popular Japanese comedian to California for a tryout with the king in his court, Koji Ishiyama. As a part of the show, the producers asked the king, could you possibly knock a juice can off of a tripod with a pitch? Well, the can was about a third the size of this. And two out of three pitches, he knocked the can off. Here's a shot of it. Here's another one in slow motion. Here's another look. The king demonstrated his skill at all kinds of venues. Here he is at Bally's Casino in Nevada, throwing blindfolded into the heart of the matter. As a former serviceman, Eddie has always had our military at heart. In fact, in 1991, he dedicated the souvenir book that year to the troops, veterans of Desert Storm, right here. Thanks to our troops, well done. The number of military bases he's played here and abroad on ships at sea is enormous. As a matter of fact, I've been told that Eddie has done more shows for the military than the incomparable Bob Hope. Our 1989 military tour in Korea was a court favorite because we got to lay over in Hawaii for games at Pearl Harbor on the way to Seoul. The King gave Dave Booth, Craig Van Poyen, Gary West and I the day off. I'm behind the camera. We got some refreshments and did some beach combing at Waikiki. After checking out the locals, we all went down to the beach to mix and mingle, and Lucky Dave met up with a very lovely young lady. Later on, we paid a visit to the Arizona Memorial, which seemed an appropriate way to get ready for our shows for the GIs. Playing tourist in Seoul, the court visited the Olympic Stadium, site of the 1988 Olympic Games, and then made the very long and arduous climb up to the Seoul Tower. Among the many camps we played, Camp Boniface was the most poignant. It's situated on the 38th parallel, where troops are on 32nd alert. It features the Panmunjom tour of the DMZ, with visits to the Peace Pagoda, and, however briefly, North Korea, via the UN-North Korea Joint Meeting Room. Playing for the troops, however, was the best part of it all. <laughs> Before they were married, Eddie's wife, Anne Marie, was the court marketing director. She's been involved with softball since she was a teenager, having played on a Michigan state championship team 
and received a State Athlete of the Year Award presented to her by Major League slugger Harmon Killebrew. She promoted and coached for many years, and besides taking over operation of the court, has joined the team at first base, the only woman to do so in court history, and she holds up her end of the show like a pro. In the spring of 1999, in Moore, Oklahoma, the court faced the most formidable opponent in tour history, much more overwhelming than the 10-time national champions Clearwater Bombers, hitting with more power than the perennial Midwest juggernaut, the Zollner Pistons, and with more speed than the king himself. The opposition that day, a Force 5 tornado, half a mile wide, traveling erratically with upper winds of 318 miles per hour, highest in recorded history. Taking cover in their motel, they said their prayers, made their goodbyes, and waited. The aftermath was one of total destruction. The king's car was under the second floor balcony, and the tour van was badly damaged, but drivable. They all found shelter in another motel, salvaged their gear, postponed the next game, rented a van, and continued the schedule. Just another typical day on tour with the king and his court. This distinctive red, white, and blue glove has graced many softball fields over the years, and Eddie's favorite ball, the Harvard 100, along with it. But perhaps the most important appearance was at the 2000 Olympic Games. The king and Anne Marie threw out the first ball. Today, Rich Hoppy, former world tournament MVP and longtime court member, has taken up the pitching duties for the court and continues the traditional mix of super softball and comedy while the king does the show from the sidelines. Long ball hitter Dave Booth handles the catching these days, and Bobby Hale out of Nova Scotia, Canada, is our utility man. The year 2000 marked Eddie's 75th birthday. After a game in Lakewood, California, several players and friends convened at the Long Beach Holiday Inn to reminisce and celebrate the King's 75th, complete with decorations and a cake. Among the current and former players were the King's son, J.R., Gary West, Rich Hoppy, Floyd Berger, Doug Potts, Eddie O'Coyne, Mark Bailey, Jim Herrick, Norm Fingston, myself, and the king's wife, Anne Marie. And oh, the stories they told. Over 50 players have worn the king in his court uniform in its history, all contributing to super fast pitch action, comedy, and family fun. Decades of it. In the future, another generation of players will follow in the footsteps of the greatest, Eddie Feiner, the king of softball. If you'd like to book a game with the King and His Court or purchase King and His Court souvenirs and memorabilia, call 1-800-627-3522 or go to www.kingandhiscourt.com.